Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 135 of our humble little podcast here, the Odd Nauseam Podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm down here in the bunker with my good friend and co-host, Dr. David Noe. How are you feeling tonight, Dave? I am feeling less superannuated than you. Really? Yes. Uh, w- explain what you mean by that. Today's your birthday, oh, buddy. that's right. It is yeah. my birthday, right. So not when the listener hears this, but today. No, uh, when we're recording. When we're recording. You're this is my birthday. Carving yeah. out some valuable podcast time on the day devoted to all things Jeff Winkle. That's right. Yeah. So uh, back home, my 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 complete my entire family is completely asleep. Mm. So I'm out here sneaking away and, and extending my birthday. That's great. By uh, recording an episode of this podcast. Visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads I, I hope so yeah i hope so yeah but uh you're so you're not as superannuated but how, no. how are you feeling oh i've been uh, i've been lucubrating once again really yeah burning the midnight oil that's right i have a big uh a big lecture i have to give on wednesday uh-huh. and it's uh boy i'm just it's down to the wire in terms of dotting all the j's and crossing the y's and so forth <laughs> that's right exactly i'm sure that'll go great i hope so yeah. i appreciate your um vote of confidence yeah well i mean i'm not not going into all the details, but you were t- describing the the topic. It sounds like a fascinating one. And, yeah, and, uh, it sounds like something that you could that you could uh, pull out of the holster at any time. And, I hope and, so. Yeah. Toss yeah. toss me a big softball. I'd like to. I don't know what's the metaphor. Uh, um, Not get an icing penalty. Yeah, exactly. Uh, snap it into the goal or something. There you like go. There, right. <laughs> so, Dave, what are we talking about tonight? Tonight is uh, part three yes. of the wonderful book by Henri Irene Marou. <clears throat> Very nice. <laughs> Going to need a towel to clean up the microphone here. <laughs> no doubt. Right. The hardest thing about French. Yeah. Is the pronunciation and the comprehension. Yeah, those two things. Yes. Other what, than that. Right, if you set those aside, right. it's, a, it's a cakewalk. Yeah. Right. So um, H.I. Maru and his work, A History of Education in Antiquity. Mm-hmm. So this was written in 1956. We are not dealing with the French edition. I'm not up to that particular task, but the translated version by one George Lamb. Mm-hmm. And this is part three. This is part three. All right. Before we get into it, I believe uh, you have noted uh, one corrigendum from last week. Yes. yes. Uh, no shout outs. No. Still hoping for some of those, but one corrigendum. Yes. And what is that? What oh, happened? It's so embarrassing. What happened? Well, we were discussing the Indiana Jones movie. Yes. And I talked about one of the scenes that was set in Algiers. Yes. And I said, I think Algiers is in... Oh, uh, Morocco. Morocco. Oh, right. <laughs> Guess where Algiers is. I think it's in Algiers. Algeria. Right. That would make sense. How it? come you didn't catch that, Winkle? I'm, I'm just as much to blame. Too much yeah. uh, birthday anticipation I and get, preparation? I guess so. Right. Yeah. So, yes, Algiers is in Algeria. Right. Yeah. Who would have guessed, no, you know? Exactly. Where is New York again? I, who knows? Yeah. Philadelphia, something like that. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So that out of the way. Yes. Uh, um, just one this week. That's nice. J- just one this week. Yes. Yep. All right. Um, so, Dave, you want to just review a little bit? Yeah, I think for, we should do that. For those who might be kind of just jumping in at part three. Sure. Uh, what, what do we do? Who's Maru and why does this matter? Right. So he was a French scholar, deci- described himself as a Christian humanist, born in 1904, died in uh, 1977, worked in the spheres of late antiquity and history of education. He's best known for this book, which is a tome. A tome. It's a tome. It is. Mm-hmm. Uh, which the etymology of which is tomos, something that's cut up yeah. into portions. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's a tome. It has uh, three parts. Part one is where we have been thus far. It's got seven chapters in part one. Begins with Homer and uh, details the distinction between the noble warrior ethos and the scribe. Right. I guess right. you could say the noble scribe. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But you see on the battlefield, you have the individuals who are fighting for valor and chivalry and so forth. This is the individual um, with his arete. Mm -hmm. Eventually, that transforms into valorizing the humble scribe with his slide rule, dare I say, his college rule to notebook, and his... um, his packet of pencils. Right. Replacing the sword and and shield and spear. That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, So we began with Homer. Yep. And and section one ends with Socrates. And last week we dealt mostly with education in Sparta. Right. We have have a a bit to pick up on the tail end of that. Yes, Uh, we do. We have to finish off some of Socrates and then we have to move on to 
a somewhat, how shall we put it, delicate chapter. Yes. Right. And uh, this is going to take um, quite a bit of skill on our part. Okay. Don't you think? <laughs> right. Yes. I mean, yes. This is this is touchy. This is touchy stuff. Touchy and, material. We might give a little bit of a listener warning at uh, one point. Right. Just because, while we're not going to say anything indecorous, the the content is in in and of itself a little bit indecorous, you might say. And if there are young children listening, maybe they should tune out. Right. And, but at the same time, any discussion of classical education and in terms of you know, what did education mean That's right. to the ancient Greeks and Romans, you can't avoid the subject. Right. Yeah. And the subject is that of pederasty. Right. And to give a brief definition, it's the romantic relationship between men and boys mm-hmm. looked at not in any sort of prurient way or leering way, but only insofar as it touches upon education. Right. Exactly. And I would also add to that, I mean, this is one of these details that has kind of I think in a purient way has kind of has become something that a lot of people quote unquote know about the ancient Greeks. Yes. Okay. Weren't they the people who, you know, fill in the blank? Right. And so I think it's also important to cover this topic in terms of, you know, kind of correcting right. um, those those kind of broader notions that are out there that uh, may not be all that accurate. We're going to try to be responsible yeah. about it. Uh, okay, before we get in, um, yep. now I realize this this is episode three on this topic, That's and, right. and we've talked about um, these these introductory things before, but I think it's, even so, it's worth it to talk about what, why does this matter, why are we asking these questions, mm-hmm. and you know, what do we even mean by when we when we use the term classical education? Right. As it turns out, Jeff, yes. I have a definition of education for us. Oh, really? This is a callback, okay. a, a deep cut, a back to the introduction, actually, don't worry, folks, page 13, just to review. This is what Maru says. Education is a collective technique which a society employs to instruct its youth in the values and accomplishments of the civilization within which it exists. Okay. All right. So that's our starting point. Why is it relevant? Both of us are educators. Mm -hmm. Uh, Both of us have received a lot of education, both formally and informally. A large portion of our audience are educators or the uh, those being educated. So these are going to be perennial questions. Yeah. Is there an ideal type of education? Right. What is it? And especially for those pursuing classical education, I think it's important to ask the question, well, what is that? Yeah, yeah. Now, I have a bit of a tangent. Yes. I think it, I think it, it relates, but um, I was having a, um, a, a discussion slash argument with a colleague of mine the other day, and she was talking about... Um, uh, one of her kids is looking at colleges, and she was talking about some of they were looking at the, like the course catalog. And one of the things that she noticed that she thought was really, really cool that there was a department offering a a course um, for humanities credit on the songs and poetry of Taylor Swift. Oh. All right. Now I have no problem with Taylor Swift. Swiftology. So, yes, yeah, so, you know the Swifties out there, right? Mm-hmm. So Jimmy, she's a she's a huge pop cultural phenomenon out there right now. Okay. And, um, but I, I scoffed, right? I scoffed and, and, uh, I'd have scoffed if I were there. Right. And she was, well, you know, well, you know, what's the problem? She says, this is like, this is like, you're talking about something, you know, now, and this is like a, a relevant phenomenon. She knew she was right? talking to a classicist, right? She did. Okay. And she did. Um, but I said, okay, fine. No shade on Miss Swift. But I my I think what I was trying to say was, I think that for something to be kind of considered, having educational value, at the very least, it has to have stood some test of time. Yeah. Right? And so when it, you were when you were talking with Maru's definition there of, of um, education, were, um, uh, on the, the sharing and the passing down of the accomplishments of a culture. Right. Um, and, and, and so uh, the idea that for something to have value in the classroom to be passed on, that it has to, it has to hold up against some kind of chronological measure it has to stick right. around it has to show some other kind of influence Stay, uh, staying power. staying power other than that it just happens to be popular right now right right and um i subscribe to that notion i think that time has a filtering effect on different kinds of literature and art yeah and some really good things are not popular in their own time like the novel Moby Dick, right, sold less than five hundred copies in Melville's lifetime. Right, right. It right. was an ab- absolute bomb. Now it's widely considered the greatest American novel. Yeah, uh, but other things are known to be great at the time, and they prove to stay so. Like uh, 
Michelangelo's David. Right. Everybody right. knew as soon as they saw it. That this is a masterpiece. That's possibly the greatest thing ever sculpted. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I just backpedaling a bit, um, I, I mean, I wouldn't say there's never a place for that kind of thing. I mean, there's, I mean, there's something to be said for for um, you know, casting a an intellectual lens on a phenomena that is happening in the moment. Yes. Right. Uh, but in terms of you know, a kind of long lasting, kind of rooted, uh, like canonical educational value, there has to be a kind of a distance of, of time and influence um, for for it to, to to earn that. Agreed. Yeah. All right, David. Let's um, let's dig into some Maru here. So okay. we have a, a bit more to say about Spartan education. Yes. Uh, where do we where do we leave off? Can you help us? Well, we're starting up with a state education, a state education, which is page nineteen, and I think this is something that would be surprising to many individuals who pursue classical education, like myself. The classical education, at least in Sparta, but also to a large extent in Athens, was conceived as a state function, a community project. Mm-hmm. It was not highly individualized. Right. 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 So page 19, Maru says, The state, meaning the state of Sparta, condescended to delegate its powers to the family until the child was seven. By Greek standards, its education had not yet begun. Up to the age of seven, a child was merely fit for rearing on a trophée, an accomplishment at which Spartan women were traditionally expert. Laconian nurses fetched top prices in the market and were particularly appreciated in Athens. This is from Plato's Alcibiades. Okay, okay, okay. But when the child was seven, it was taken in hand by the state, and it was state property until the day of its death. This is when the the young Spartan boys would go off to live in the barracks, right? That's correct. Not just the boys, the girls too. Girls too. Its education in the strict sense lasted until it was 20. It was placed under the direct authority of a special magistrate, an absolute commissar of national education, the Pydonomos. That is the one that makes rules for kids, okay. the Pydonomos. Right. Do you like that job? Uh, no, that sounds like a nightmare to it me. It sounds terrible, doesn't <laughs> it? Does, it? it does. For me, it'd be all Twinkies and soda pop. <laughs> That's right, exactly. What are we going to do today? <laughs> right. well, let's give them a round of Twinkies. <laughs> That's right, just sugar them up. That's right. <laughs> Maybe if one tries to do a sit-up or a push-up, good enough. Good enough, right. Yeah, keep that going. Yep, yeah. here's, here's your Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were made to join various youth organizations, rather like the Boy Scouts in some respects, but still more like the totalitarian youth movements, the Juventus Fascista and the Hitler, the Hitler Jugend. All right, so he Maru's just jumped, throwing he, down. He just went from uh, the the Boy Scouts to Hitler and Mussolini. That's correct. <laughs> okay, right. Scholars, even from the days of antiquity, have always been interested in the highly complicated, picturesque language that was used to describe the early classes. He says, here I shall confine myself to giving what, after much consideration, I have come to regard as the best hypothesis. Then he breaks down uh, the education of the child from eight until uh, 20 years old into three stages. Eight to 11 is the little boy. 12 to 15 is the adolescent. 16 to 20 is the ephib. So there are Greek terms corresponding to every year through which they had to move. Hmm. And it's not kindergarten and first grade and second. It's chrobidos, meaning unknown, promikizomenos, the very little boy, mikizomenos, the little boy, propais, the young adolescent, almost a boy. Then you are the protopampais, the adolescent first year, then the hatropampais, the second year, the malay rain, the future ephib, and so on and so forth. Until you finally get to year number 15, and you are Proteros. You are the senior A-Ren. That's a particular title. Okay. It's every year of this child's life from 8 until 20 was highly regulated and supervised by a state official. Okay. All right. So this is, no, this is, we're still just talking about just Sparta here. Just Sparta. Right. So this was not. not everywhere. Okay. All right. Yep. So he goes on, the whole system of education was thus collective. Children were simply torn from their families and made to live in community, and the process was progressive. During the first four years, the wolf cubs, Mikazomenoi, only met for games and exercises, but at the age of 12, the adolescent, the Pompais, had to be made tougher and was obliged to leave home and go to a boarding school, i.e. the barracks. He could not leave, even if he got married, before he was 30. Wow. 30. Man. So you give 22 years of your life. That is that uh, to is the crazy. state. Yeah. I mean there's some I mean there's not uh, like a a one to one reflection 
of that in Athenian society. But what it, for the Athenians, it was, I mean, I think they also kind of considered that you didn't kind of reach full manhood until age 30. Was that wasn't that kind of the, the, the point at which you, you kind of stepped into your full yes, public, I think that's public right. life, right? Yep. Um, but just the, the amount of, of regulation and supervision and control that mm-hmm. you had, Sparta had over, over all these kids mm-hmm. until, the, and, until the age is incredible. Yeah. So you're probably wondering, what did they learn? What did they learn? Yeah. Uh, page 21, they learned to be soldiers. Everything was sacrificed to that, says Maru. The intellectual side of their education was immediately reduced to a minimum. Everything centered around military training so that physical education came first, but athletics and sports, like hunting, were no longer part of an aristocratic way of life. Their aim was simply to develop physical strength. Very soon, the boy began to do real military training as well as gymnastics, learning how to move with others in formation, how to handle arms, how to fence and throw the javelin, and so on. The Spartan army was the only professional army in classical Greece. Until the 4th century, all the other city-states relied on improvised citizen armies. Mm -hmm. So Socrates and Euripides are sitting around. I guess we better get up and go fight. Right. Right. That was it. That was it. You're responsible for your own armor. A militia. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, says Maru, the Spartan army was universally admired for its skill in maneuvers. It could suddenly change from formation in file to formation in line in perfect order and do this just as faultlessly on the battlefield as on the parade ground. Right, right. So we were talking, we were talking last week about um, how the Spartans dominated those early centuries at the Olympic Games. Yes. Right? And, uh, More than half of the victors in the sprint, right? The stadium sprint, which was the marquee event. Right. Right. And I think it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, today, you know, the, the modern Olympics, they carry just a kind of a faint whiff of their, their ancient predecessor. I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the ethos of the Olympic Games right. is bringing the, the nations together under the banner of peace. Right. Yes. Well, and there's also pageantry and the ancient games had pageantry. Sure. Right. Um, but I think what's often missed is, is that, you know, the ancient Olympic Games was kind of a way to do war without doing war. Exactly. Right? So, you know, all the, all the events where if you were good at those events, that probably means you were good at them on the battlefield. Would you say right? that the martial spirit of the ancient Olympics is particularly seen in um, one of our favorite events, uh, rhythmic gymnastics? <laughs> exactly right. Anytime there's ribbon twirling, I'm often, I'm often called back to the ancient Spartans. <laughs> Although was one of the uh, ancient Olympic events was the, the warrior dance, right? Yes, there, there was uh, a, it's not that far off. Right, exactly. So you, you cross they, Cirque du Soleil with the, you know, an athletic event. That's what you get. Right. So do you imagine they had judges holding up tablets? With, I don't know. With numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, aside from that warrior dance, which I don't fully can't wrap my no. head around, but um, if you were good at running, sprinting, throwing a javelin and, and riding horses, that, yeah, you could, that's um, reflective of being uh, a, a great warrior. That's right. And no uh, warfare during the time of the game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The cessation of hostility. Mm-hmm. So Maru goes on to talk about Sparta's uh, totalitarian morality. Okay. Everything, quote, everything was sacrificed to, to the safety and interest of the national community. The ideal was an absolute patriotism. Devotion to the state carried to, to the supreme limit of death. The only standard of goodness was what served the interest of the city. Whatever helped to increase the greatness of Sparta was right. Consequently, in relationships with foreign powers, Machiavellianism was the rule. And in the 4th century, there were to be some shocking examples of Machiavellianism from Spartan generals. Does he give examples of that? No. That's what I want to hear about. (laughs) Well, they come, you can read about them in Thucydides. Okay. Some of the things that uh, Spartan generals did to their own men Hmm. because they were expendable. Right. There was not a kind of esprit de corps that um, risks the safety of the group for the preservation of the individual. Right, right, right. You only risk the safety of the group if... It preserves a larger group, right? But not a smaller subset. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you want to talk a little bit, Jeff, about the uh, education of girls in the Spartan state? Yes, my pleasure. This is on page twenty-three of Maru's book. So far, we have been concerned with the boys. The girls too were brought up to be Spartans. Their education was rigidly controlled, with music, dancing, and singing occupying a less important place than gymnast- gymnastics and sport. The grace they had had in the archaic era was sacrificed to a crude utilitarianism. Like the women under fascism, their first duty was to produce as many bouncing babies as possible, and all their education was subordinated to this one end. They had to learn to put aside all delicacy and womanish tenderness by hardening their bodies and appearing naked at feasts and ceremonies. 
The idea was to turn virgins into strapping viragos with no illusions about sentiment who would mate in the best interests of the race. Wow. Hmm. Which would be worse, to be a woman in the Spartan system or to be a man? Yeah, I know. They both sound so horrible. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we were talking last week about how you know Spartan um, women had, they, they competed in games as well. That's right. And you know, The Romans a, found that charming. Right. And you know, from a modern perspective... Someone might say, "Oh, look! You know, the Spartans were you know ahead of their time." Oh. And such, but, but you have to look at the whole picture. Yes, you can pull any little tiny strand from a civilization or a right. culture and say, "You know, it's superior to some other culture." Right. And I don't doubt that in some ways it was, but yes. in other ways, definitely not. Exactly. I think we we I know we've talked personally. I'm sure. I'm sure we've talked about it on the on the on the show as well that um, when we when we, like in our classes or when we talk about. Uh, you know, ancient Greek civilization, and um, we we kind of share our love for that civilization. Right. Um, that is, at some I may have had students kind of mistake that for this oh. idea that this is kind of this is an ideal that we need to go back no, to. No, no, right? it's a highly selective love. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes, of course. Right. Right. Um, I mean, it, deeply fascinating. Correct. And, and certainly, uh, one of the re- reasons that I I love it and fascinated by it because you, it still influences and ripples out to sure. the present day. But that's not this. And idea. there are some parts of it that I would like to see revived. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, of course. Like the you know the devotion to um, literature as a part of public entertainment. Sure. Yeah. In the tragedies and the comedies. I mean, they were not only really interesting and funny and entertaining. Yes. They had high literary content. Right. Maybe there's something like that and I'm just missing it. Yeah, exactly. Maybe opera is on line one. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that all of the other stuff is, you know, thereby um, given a pass. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So like, yes, uh, um, yeah, a selective love for particular things. Correct. Um, but yeah, but um, yes, with... Um, Yes, the the women, the Spartan women. Yes, they competed at their their own games and were very good at it. However, right. that's yeah, it's just a small slice of a much larger pie. There's a little bit of a posture involved in that as well. For me, at least, when I have taught on these subjects, it's kind of taking a um, a devil's advocate somewhat mm-hmm. to try to break through the students' general disinclination to think about another culture and its claims. So I might exaggerate a little bit, right? Okay. The value of what the Greeks and the Romans taught and thought and did. But in a more sober moment, I'd be more than willing to admit all of the flaws and defects that every culture has. Right, 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 right. Sometimes yeah. students don't really understand. This is a just a little bit of the promo. Do you know, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I got to overdo it a little bit to get you to take it seriously. Right, right. But if, if we're going to get down to brass tacks, well then, yes, obviously... Every culture has much about it to criticize. Yes, well said. Well said. Yes, I, I like that a lot. So, um, I mean, one thing I I, uh, I wanted to get back to is um, I think it's something we also mentioned last week. Of course, you know, the Spartans left almost nothing behind in terms of written culture. Right. right? They couldn't agree on how to even spell their own words. Yep. Right. Uh, Smugly uh, anarchic. That's what. That's the phrase. That's right. Maru's phrase. Maru's phrase. Um, so you know. So how much of the stuff about the Spartans, you know, is in some of historically trustworthy. Right? Well, it's all uh, detailed in the book under the title, The Spartan Mirage, okay. remember, which is the section that we're getting to next. Okay. And that is so much of our knowledge, I think I said it last time, of Spartan culture and structure is filtered through highly sympathetic aristocratic Athenians. Yes. Yeah. Should I read a little bit of Maru here? Yes, please. Okay. What, so, What page are we on? We're still on page 23 here. Um and he's talking about this you know, this enthusiasm that you know different cultures had for the Spartans, right? Um, and so he says this enthusiasm had had its precursors amongst the ancients. In fact, we know Sparta primarily through the romantic, idealized picture of her pre- of of her presented by fanatical partisans, especially those who are found to be amongst her old enemies in Athens. Hmm. Towards the end of the fifth century and throughout the fourth, the triumph of de- democratic tendencies became more pronounced and their hold more secure. And the party of old right-wing aristocrats and oligarchs fell back into a surly, sterile opposition, the victims of a veritable neurotic introversion, projecting onto Sparta their own frustrated ideals. That's a little bit of purple prose there, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Do you think you could simplify it for us a bit? Yeah. So I think w- what, what is Maru saying? I think what he's saying is that so as the fifth century went on, right, and in um, in Athens as the democratic experiment kind of took hold. Um, the the oligarchs, you know, the 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 part of the the population that was you know moneyed and and, and status and had the family name began to become more resentful of this. Specifically, landholders, right? Right, 
And, and so they, as a way of kind of pushing back against their, I guess, loss of status in this, they, they, they kind of look to Sparta uh, and idealize Sparta as a way of, of countering what they saw happening in their own city. So a classic reactionary kind of move. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, do, you, do you buy that? Uh, it, it, well, I have always bought it, but as you were describing it, I was thinking whether there is a revisionist view of that. And there probably is, which would tend to maybe tone it back a little bit. Yeah. The way I've usually told the story to, to students, and I think it's, it's a helpful thumbnail, is to contrast Miltiades with Themistocles. Okay. That takes us back all the way to 480, right? right. But Miltiades was the uh, land-owning aristocrat, so well represented by Aristophanes later on. And because he had won at Marathon, mm -hmm. he thought that that was, of course, the way for Athenians always to win. Themistocles was also from a noble family, but he came, became a representative of the democratic impulse. Yes. And so I think those two individuals, their um, opposite polar positions really played out through the rest of the century. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. I hadn't thought of it of kind of using those, those, two, those two men as uh, examples of, of either side, but I think that works really, really well. You could do the yeah. same sort of thing. And I think Aristophanes does it in the uh, frogs with Aeschylus and Euripides. Euripides, yes. Yeah. And Sophocles is the moderate uh, in the center, but these two individuals are at the extremes. Right. Right. Conservatism and, at least in uh, Aristophanes' mind, progressivism for Euripides. Right. And it's worth reminding the audience that um, he, uh, he uh, Dionysus ultimately chooses to go back with Aeschylus. At the right. Play, right? Yeah. So, well, that reveals all of Aristophanes. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Sympathies in this debate. Right. Yeah. All right, Jeff. So could you uh, wrap up this chapter on Spartan education with some choice quotes and some brilliant commentary? Right. So uh, in the, on the last couple of pages of this chapter, Maru is kind of wrestling with uh, kind of what happened to Sparta. Yes. Right? And so, you know, where, where did it go? Where did it go? And, and um, you know, how did the uh, um, you know, how did this great civilization, um, this great culture come to an end? So he writes, I believe I am as conscious of Sparta's true greatness as most people. But I observed that she was great when she was beautiful and just in those golden age when, in Terpander's words, she nurtured the valor of young men, the muse of harmony, and that mistress of all that is great, justice with her generous ways. When civic virtue and military might were per perfectly balanced, and there was a smile of humanity in the mischievous grace of its maidens and elegance in their ivory brooches, Sparta only began to grow hard when she began to decline. That's, mm. a, that's some. That is some very purpley prose. It is. There. It's good prose. <laughs> it is elegance I, in their ivory brooches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there must be artifacts, right? Spartan artifacts that have survived of yeah. women wearing ivory brooches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I wonder what the French is like there. If uh, Lamb has done credit to the. Oh, yeah, I, I keep forgetting that this is a translation. It is. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me continue there. So, uh, Marissa, says, Sparta's tragedy was that she matured too soon. She tried to make the first blessed moment of an early acme. Uh, eternal and grew rigid, glorifying in the fact that she was no longer subject to change, as though life were not essentially a matter of change and death alone immutable. Everything in classical Sparta began from a refusal of life. Hmm. In the first place, as we have seen, there was the arist aristocracy's egotistic reaction in refusing to extend civic rights to the com combatants in the Mycenaean Wars. As regards external affairs, Sparta was jealous of the growth of states or cultures more recent than her own. Hmm. So he sees Sparta's inflexibility um, their um, their inability to respond and adapt to change is what kind of hardened. Yeah, and very different from Athens, who enfranchised tens of thousands of rowers, right? Right. In order to man their ships to defeat the Persians. Exactly. So they went all in, whereas the Spartans retrenched. Right. So Athens called up Sparta and said, "Hey, Sparta, just take it easy, right? Mm -hmm. Relax." And what did Sparta do? Broke the phone in half. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I have to think that. Um, you know, by the time we get down to the to the to the Romans and and someone like Caesar um, doing his conquering and wondering, oh, what are we going to do with all of these conquered people and you know offering them a clemency or, right. or later on, you know, offering um, you know, conquered people's a uh, um, citizenship mm -hmm. to some degree, taking a lesson from the Athenians or right. from the Spartans, while maybe a, a deeply admiring the Spartans for their their metal on the on the battlefield. Um, playing the long game yeah. is something that the Spartans did not know how to do. Definitely not. Yeah. But if we could go back to the phone for just a yes, minute. Yes, please. This is one of the really sad things about, and this is not original to me, but I wonder if you've thought about it, hmm. of the ubiquity of cell phones. 
back in the good old days when yes. you had finished a conversation and you were angry with the individual, what did you do? You, <laughs> you slammed, slammed that it down right. into the receiver. <laughs> right. and it was hard plastic. It made a good sound. <laughs> and it was so satisfying. If you slammed it hard enough, you could even uh, uh, trigger the bell that was still in it, right? And it, yes. would, it would clang a little bit. Exactly. That was so satisfying. Right. Now? There's nothing to do. You can push the end conversation button very firmly. Right. Right. Or, or, I mean, uh, it also as your know, actual conversations are having less and less, you can, uh, you can send some kind of angry emoji. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I guess. <laughs> so, it's just not the same. It reminds me of an old uh, Mitch Hedberg routine where he talks about, um, it's uh, the unsatisfying. Uh, oh, so you're going to digress now? Yeah, a little bit. Well, it's, it's your a, birthday. It is, right. So the unsatisfying experience of having an argument in a tent because you can't slam the door. It's, it's, you can't slam the flap. You wouldn't just zip it up really fast. That's funny. This is why I don't camp. <laughs> For that reason alone? Well, yes. If an argument breaks out, I might need to slam something. Right. Yeah. And you can't, you can't no. slam a flap. Right. right. Speaking of slamming flaps. Yes. It's time for the ads. Let's do it. This episode of Odd Nauseam is brought to you by the good folks at Ratio Coffee. R-A-T-I-O-C-O-F-F-E-E dot com is where you want to go if you want to find one of these incredible machines. The Ratio 8, the Ratio 6, and coming soon... The Ratio 4. Which I'm very excited about. If, you know, if I get the four, I will have collected them all. The, <laughs> the first kid on my block. You're going to keep them still in the original packaging, like those old um, Wookiees and Ewoks? Exactly, and, exactly. And, and, and the then, first kid on your block. And then one day show up at Coffee Con. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. You can't get these by sending in a cereal box tops, which nobody does anymore. No, but. man. Did you ever send in the box tops? Of course. Tops? Yeah, so, man, I got every free thing. Sometimes I, I had to eat so much cereal <laughs> just to get the box top. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, Dave, um, do, you have, do you have some poetry? About I do. Share? Okay. Well. Yeah, I have wrote a little limerick. Okay. Um, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. It's awful. Okay. Here goes. Today is the birthday for Jeff, Here not Katrina, go. nor Jimmy, nor Steph. So buy from our sponsors and swell up his coffers, or he may just go work as a ref. <laughs> Oh man! Oh, that is dismal. <laughs> was that no? Was that Chat GPT or was that all you? No, that was me. Yeah, right? <laughs> I devoted twenty seconds of my life to this thing. Right, right. You know how hard it is to get uh, Jeff to rhyme. It's it is it is. I hard. got Jeff, right. Steph, Steph, and, and Ref. Ref. Right. There's yeah. There's not much. There's no. Not, it doesn't give you much room. And even right. harder is Winkle. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Right. So well, I appreciate you working me into the. You're welcome. My birthday into sponsors, the coffers. Right. That's not too bad. Right. I don't you know. Want me to read it again? No, it's good. me either. Got, right. Right. <laughs> so. um so yeah, um, ratio coffee. I'm assuming yes. that you brewed something up in your ratio eight. This Absolutely, morning. I did. Use my Barazza grinder. Yeah. Set it at 21, which is the perfect setting, and uh, I brewed up a delicious pot right down into the hulking flagon, which mm -hmm. keeps it warm. Bypassed the hand blown borosilicate glass. Nice. The off gassing got rid of the uh, the uh, the uh, the something the gas uh, wait, brackish. The tang. brackish tang. Where have I been? I don't know. No, right. Brackish <laughs> tang. I have the one with the uh, oyster shell yep. color and the walnut accents. Yeah, I got the stainless steel. Solid machine. It's beautiful. Yes. I also have the, um, I got the uh, the metal cone. Yes. Which sits in kind of the ceramic, uh, um, I don't even know what you call that thing. It's Duhaki. Right, the the Duhaki. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a thing to behold. It is. Now, you were just telling me um, kind of uh, between things about you had a, a crock pot mishap. I did. Um, but uh, you Racer doesn't make a crock pot. No, but they don't. But if they did. If they did, I'd buy one. That's right. Um, but uh, you, I never have mishaps with my with my eight. Never. It's a, it's so it's it's beautiful in its simplicity. You you press that button, you got the three stages, and you're ready to go. Yep, very reliable. Right. So, listener, if you want to score for yourself one of these machines, please go to ratiocoffee.com. R a t i o coffee.com. Check out their wide variety of excellent machines, and then you want to enter this coupon code, A N C O four. Z. That's A N C O four Z. Jeff, what does the Z stand for? I think zesty. Zesty. Yeah. And what will this uh, coupon code earn for the listener? That will get them fifteen percent off their entire order. Excellent. Check it out. This episode of Ad Nauseum is also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Hackett Publishing in business now for fifty three years. Mm -hmm. Begun in nineteen seventy with offices in where are their offices? Indianapolis and Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's yes. correct. Yeah. They have been bringing excellent translations of a wide variety of classical works, plus other things, modern philosophy, Asian philosophy, Japanese history, a whole book devoted to the samurai. Islamic studies. That's right. Yep. It's a, you it's name it, thing. they have it. Yep. 
So, Jeff, what do you like about um, Hackett? And no mentioning the covers, even though it's your birthday. I know. Well, I, what I don't like is I, that I don't have a limer, limerick prepared, even though it's much easier to rhyme Hackett than Jeff, right? You've got... Uh, yeah, that's true. Hackett. And, and it's also much easier to make fun of those who write limericks <laughs> than to write them yourself. <laughs> that's, that's true. This uh-huh. is true, right. So now the limerick's on the other foot. Yeah. I love Hackett yeah. because... Um, I teach a lot of students who don't have a lot of extra pocket money, and when I order a text from Hackett and, and require them to buy them, I know that they're getting a great deal, and they're going to be wonderful to use in the class. The translations are, 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 are rock solid. Um, I usually have uh, a couple of, at least a couple of translations on the same work mm-hmm. that, that I'm teaching, and so I love that kind of variety. Um, I, I do love the art. I'm not going to go into any detail about that beyond that. Um, yeah, and I love them for my own personal collection. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I find it hard to say a, a bad thing about anything that I've used from Hackett. And they've been supporting us now yep. uh, for more than three years, uh, very generously wanting the classics to be popularized and brought to a mass yet erudite audience. Right. And so they got right on board and have been just wonderful sponsors. Yes. So, listener, if you want to support both this podcast and your own appetite for classical learning, please go to Hackett Publishing, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, HackettPublishing.com, check out what they have, drop some items in your grocery satchel, and then what should they do, Jeff? They should type in the coupon code AN2023. That's, that, AN. that's the current year. It is the current All year. Right. Yeah, with AN standing for ad nauseum. And Dave, that will get them 20% off their entire order and free shipping. Check it out. All right, Jeff, so as we get back into it, Mm -hmm. my understanding is you have a few more comments to make about Sparta. Right. So Maru makes this really interesting observation uh, at the end of that chapter where um, this goes back to, uh, as we're talking about the Spartans, I'm remembering the time that um, we've we've gone to Sparta together. And when you walk through the, over the Acropolis of ancient Sparta and look at the ruins, there's not a ton to see. Thucydides' prediction was more or less spot on. Um, And in terms of the remains that are there that are linked to, you know, the the famous 5th century BC Spartans, there's almost nothing to see. But the one place where you do see a, a remnant of that society is the sanctuary of Artemis um, Orthia. Mm. And Maru talks about that, that that kind of that open air sanctuary was a place where, uh, from Maru's point of view, when Spartan education, when they were at their kind of their, their acme, right. at their best, it was a place where uh, young boys would um, kind of perform acts of bravery um, you know, for the delight of the crowd is kind of part of their education. Um, but over time, it became blood sport. Mm-hmm. And the people came to that sanctuary to see the young men whipped sometimes um, to their death. Yeah, And so he, he uses that example of um, a, a, a cultural piece that change it degrades over time right. as the culture itself is kind of degrading. Do you think there's uh, anything inevitable to that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I I find those kind we of... We probably don't want to indulge in rampant moralizing. Right. We uh, are pretty old now. Right. I, I mean, I, I definitely, I mean, I find myself, I do, you know, think along those lines sometimes when, you know, I think about um, uh, the things within popular culture. Yes, I think about that too. Uh, that, that certainly seem to be kind of on a steep decline. Yes. Um, at the same time, it makes me think of, um, you know, the, you know, the Romans loved their blood sport. They certainly did. In a way that the Greeks you know, didn't. Um, and or they, they devoted more resources to it. R- yeah. It was more of a public spectacle. It was. And I mean, you have, I'm not you, sure about the relative loves, but in terms of cultural engagement, the yes. Romans, you know, had them beaten hands down. Exactly. Right. And, and, and I think, I mean, this is a bit subjective, but I think if you were to compare, you know, Roman tragedy to Mm -hmm. Sophocles, I I think you'd find very few people to say that the, the Romans, they topped uh, Sophocles and Euripides and the like, um, their comedy was very, was very, was quite different. Right. Um, but I don't know about that, that argument that, you know, the uh, decline in the arts or a a move from symbolism to blood sport is always indicative of kind of an inevitable decline. Right. Because I think that in terms of, so if we use the Romans as our example, um, the way they centered, um, you know, blood sport in their popular culture doesn't necessarily coincide with. Uh, you know, it it uh, you know it it got to its worst right before the end. Right. I mean, you have that kind of thing going on. You have you have Seneca, you know, uh, responding viscerally against it. You have you know Cicero mm-hmm. um, complaining about um, what's happening in the arena. Yeah, in one of his letters, famously right. talking about why do I want to see an elephant plead for its life? Right. Exactly. And those are you know, especially with Cicero, this is 
long before the ultimate decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Right. So I, I don't know what to make of those those arguments um, uh, um, as a you know, as a template for you know kind of interpreting history or the future. Right. But um, I get where Murrow's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. And the time in which he lived, of course. Yes. Yeah. After the brutalities of the Second World War. Exactly. Yep. All right, Dave. We got to get to our, our yes, our difficult a more, subject, a more here. delicate subject, yep. a delicate topic, and uh, just to give a little bit of a, a listener warning, and maybe um, what I take to be a necessary precaution. Maybe others don't see it that way. So this is chapter three, and the title is "Pederasty in Classical Education." We've already given a definition of it. It is the cultivation of same-sex male relationships within the context of education. And um, I think we should just start here. So if you're a, a, a parent who doesn't want young listeners to listen, uh, turn this off. We're going to try to be um, discreet and responsible. There's nothing prurient in the chapter. Right. All right. So page 26. I must now speak of pederasty, he says, for it affects education, declared Xenophon when he came to this subject in his analysis of the institutions of Sparta. They are words with which all must agree. For we are all aware of the place occupied by masculine love in Greek civilization. Then he goes on to give, that's the end of the quote, Maru goes on to give four kinds of truisms or maxims about this particular practice. And I think it's really helpful to frame the entire discussion, which will be, I think, somewhat brief. Okay. The first one was, um, its place was particularly important in the educational field. Nevertheless, this subject, fundamental though it is, is seldom mentioned by the historian without an excessive circumspection, as though it were bound up with an unhealthy curiosity. And indeed, certain modern writers have wasted a great deal of time in malignantly scrutinizing the ancient evidence relating to, quote, love affairs with boys, confining their interest to the sexual aspect of the matter. Mm -hmm. Some have tried to represent ancient Greece as a pervert's paradise, but this is going too far. The very vocabulary of the Greek language and the laws of most of the city-states show that homosexuality was always regarded as something, quote, abnormal. Others have tried to deceive themselves into making a case for pure pederasty as opposed to carnal inversion. But this contradicts the most unequivocal evidence. Hmm. So there's a lot to unpack there. Yes, right, right. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, definitely I think that uh, he's getting at kind of that notion of this is one of those things that a lot of people, quote unquote, know about the ancient Greeks. Correct. And it, it becomes almost a kind of a stand in for the whole. And oh, he, yeah. he says they either talk about it too much yes. in the wrong way or they don't talk about it at all. Right. Or they or they reduce it um, to the just the simply the, the aspect of, of sex. When That's it's right. A, it's a much bigger thing than that. Right. Yeah. So then he asks this question, what then was the precise position? And what is the answer that he gives? He says, the question is, of course, a complex one. And to answer it, we need to distinguish between the various levels of morality that existed at different times and places, for the peoples of Greece did not all react to pederasty in the same way. We can imagine the difficulty which sociologists of the future will have when they try to decide what place adultery had in the lives of 20th century Frenchmen. Just as for us, there is contradictory evidence from ancient times, so for them there will be evidence, evidence as diverse as the vaudeville at the Palais Royal on the one hand and the spiritual writings on Christian marriage on the other. Yeah. All right. This, I mean, this reminds me of kind of discussions I have with my students when they will use a sentence like, well, it seems like the ancient Greeks believed, you know, fill in the blank. Right. Right. And you get why, why I get why they say that. Sure, because um, it's, it's natural and helpful to try to summarize complex things exactly. in simple terms. Yeah, and sometimes it's it's simply necessary. But right. I, I like Maru's uh, um, reminder here that we're, we're talking about a, uh, a difficult subject, but we're, also, but we're not talking about a monolith either. Right. So each time and place, each different lens is going to have a different approach and, and understanding of this of this topic. Yep. Okay, so as Maru develops his argument, mm -hmm. uh, let's look at page 29, right. where he says, in the first place... The Greek type of love helped to create the particular kind of moral ideal that underlay the whole system of Hellenic education. This ideal I began to analyze when I was discussing Homer. The elder's desire to stand out in the eyes of his beloved to shine, and the younger man's corresponding desire to show himself worthy of his lover could not but strengthen in both that love of glory which was, moreover, extolled by the whole agonistic outlook. The amorous relationship was the chosen ground for affectionate emulation. Moreover, the knightly ethic was based 
on a sense of honor and reflected the ideal of comradeship of arms. The tradition of antiquity is unanimous in linking the practice of pederasty with valor and courage. Okay, so I mean, earlier in the chapter, and we, did, we didn't quote from it, but he talks about how um, this uh, the situation for this this type of Greek love was overwhelmingly a feature of military society. Yes, right? that's his claim. So in this this part that we just quoted, he seems to be saying that um, even when it stopped being part of you know say the bonding between soldiers in a barracks, it still had kind of the aspect of of, of valor and honor. Uh, but now kind of outside of the the military context. Right. Am I reading that right? I think so. Okay. What I have learned from previous study and what I have told students, it's not so much based on Malkru, but um, a study of other uh, scholarship and research, is that the practice of uh, pederasty in Sparta was somewhere between um, encouraged and expected up till a certain age. Yeah. And then it was strictly punished. Right. Right. It was very it was very circumscribed. Right. Yeah. And the reason is that it did not contribute, as we were just reading about a woman's role, it did not contribute in Sparta at least to the propagation of the race. Yeah. You know, men of a certain age past thirty were expected to have children, lots of children. Yes. Not because childbearing or children were good in themselves, but as we just learned, because uh, this served the needs of the state. Yes, exactly. Right. So it's a very unusual way compared to how moderns would think about this practice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So it um, it had a, a role or a potential role uh, between soldiers to bond them together. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, if you're if you're fighting in a phalanx and you are you know, you are you are fighting, you're you're protecting yourself, but you're also protecting the guy to your left. Right. Um, that kind of to whom you may have an amorous right, attachment. Exactly. Might might um, uh, be a a kind of glue to hold the battle line uh, right. together. But outside of that context and outside of that particular aim. Um, it uh, it did not have the it did not have the same kind of value. Right. Yeah. What do you make of what he says at the bottom of page twenty nine? Okay. Yes, he writes. We may go further. Greek love was to provide classical education with its material conditions and its method. For the men of ancient times, this type of love was essentially educative. Kai epichere paidewain. Its aim is to educate, as Plato says. Yeah, that's from the symposium. It looks like. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to continue? Yeah. The establishment of a closed masculine community from which women were excluded had an educational significance and in a certain sense derived from an educational impulse. For although it exaggerated it to the point of absurdity and folly, it expressed a profound need, that which impels men to realize to the full all the tendencies that are most characteristic of their sex, the desire to become men in the fullest sense. The essence of pederasty did not lie in abnormal sexual relations. I have already mentioned how the Greek language expressed the disgust that was felt by Greek sensibility for the passive kind of inversion that is meant when Gide used the word. Pederasty was primarily a form taken by sensibility and indeed an anti-feminine ideal of complete manliness. Hmm. All right, there's a lot there. There is a lot there. Right, so um, one thing that that he seems to be saying is that you could compare this... um, to uh, a kind of educational environment of like a, an all boys school, right? And it it was more about having a space for men to bond in a particular way, more so than it was about men having intimate relations with each other, right? Right. Although that could be a part of it. Yes, and it often was, at least in certain ways. You might read the evidence, although Maru is careful throughout the chapter to say, "Don't overread the evidence. Don't psychologize everything." And he takes some shots at. The psychology of his time, which is too quick to see uh, erotic relationships and activity where there may be just something more like a close friendship. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm reminded of um, like readings of uh, the relationship between Patroclus and, and Achilles. Right. Right. Yeah. Same kind of thing. I think Maru uh, really pulls no punches in this next section. You want to read a bit? From yeah, that? I okay. would. I think he really uh, crystallizes some of the issues. He says, I have undertaken this painstaking analysis of what is, after all, a dreadful aberration, because for the Greeks it was the normal mode, the standard type of all education. Paideia, which is the term for education, found its realization in paiderasteia. This seems strange to a modern, or at any rate to a Christian, but it must be realized that it was an integral part of the ancient system. The family could not be the educational center. The wife was kept in the background. She was considered fit enough to look after the baby, but no more. 
When the child was seven, it was taken out of her hands. As for the father, he was absorbed in public affairs, for we must not forget that we are speaking of what was originally an aristocracy. He was a citizen and a man of politics before he was head of the family. Read again Plato's curious remarks on this subject at the beginning of the Lakeys. He shows us two fathers coming to consult Socrates about their son's education. Their own has been lamentably neglected. We approach our fathers for letting us we reproach, excuse me, our fathers for letting us have our own way during our youth because they were too taken up with the affairs of others. These two men were in fact the great Aristides and Thucydides, the son of Milesius, the aristocratic leader who opposed Pericles and was ostracized by the people of Athens in 443. And so it is not surprising that Plato should elsewhere declare quite bluntly that the relationship of pederasty establishes between the two lovers a union far closer, palu mezo koinonion, than that which binds parents to their children. Hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. So um, he seems to be making the argument that um, uh, because of the mother's limited role right, and uh, the fact that fathers were largely absent that the kind of the, the 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 formation of of a young boy into adulthood had to take place somewhere else that's right yeah he makes f- first the point that you can't ignore this because it was considered in antiquity the realization he says of paideia itself mm-hmm. uh, and he acknowledges that it's strange to a modern um, and at least to a christian but you can't cut it out of the educational system right. in any of the Greek city-states. Now, Rome's completely different. Yes. But to get back to Greece, I think it's important to say that uh, the instruction of the child was not placed in the hands of the mother because there was any deficiency in the mother. It was a cultural expectation that she was not suited somehow right. to train a boy how to be a man. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, near the bottom of that same page, I thought this was... Um, um, I, I, I know this is not where was kind of wrapping up the chapter, no. right? but um, I thought this was a kind of a, a nice uh, kind of summary of things. He, he writes this, for the Greeks, education, paideia, meant essentially a profound and intimate relationship, a personal union between a young man and an elder who was at once his model, his guide, and his initiator, a relationship onto which the fire of passion threw warm and turbid reflections. Hmm. So, um, What do you make of that? Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, to link this to the the previous paragraph that you just read is that it seems that um, it, this was, uh, from the Greek point of view, um, a, a, a part of parenting for the child that was necessary that couldn't happen in the home, hmm. right? And so that that relationship with the the mentor, who then would become a lover, yeah. was uh, absolutely essential in 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 bringing up the child to where he needed to be. Right. And then once it reached a point. Then that was done, right? And then it was that was kind of considered a beyond the pale. I mean, I think that I think about you know um, one of the the butts of Aristophanes' jokes, you know, Cleisthenes, right? Um, who's often uh, taken to task for his his um, his passions as an ad, as a as an adult man, right? I think part of the punch of that joke is that um, what Cleisthenes is doing and that he's the things he's interested in are kind of he's he's well past the the time Correct. That he should be doing those things, right? Right. right. Yeah, definitely. I remember the first time that I encountered this, it was in an undergraduate philosophy class on Plato. Hmm. And one of the uh, one of my classmates was maintaining, well, you know, we kind of know that Plato is advocating uh, pederasty, homosexuality generally. Um, And the professor uh, whom I respected uh, greatly at the time and still do made the categorical claim that uh, that's just not accurate one has to deliberately read into the text of Plato um, those kinds of uh, inferences. Hmm. I guess you can't read an inference in, but you you have to read into the text in order to take it out of um, what Plato was saying. And that it's the accusations against Plato from a Christian perspective have been mostly fabricated. Hmm. Now, I've thought about that a lot since that time because I've gone on to study Plato quite seriously. Right. And I think that on the whole... My teacher was probably exaggerating a little bit. Okay, okay. Um, Nevertheless, I think it's more common to see that sort of thing everywhere than not to see it. Yeah, yeah. At least in the time that we live in. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I think his great, my, my teacher's great passion for the exalted thought of Plato and his desire to make sure that students didn't write him off. Yes. Write Plato off completely because of things that they didn't like. 
um, led him maybe to exaggerate the case somewhat. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, yeah. All right, Dave. I think that um, I think we're up against it. Yes. And I think we should uh, we should make our way out of here. And so next week we're going to. But before we go on, though, yeah. so so what do you think, Jeff? I mean, what? the listener who's listened to what like 134 episodes now, something hopefully. Yes. They could probably tell that yeah, you know, at least for me, I was kind of uncomfortable discussing this topic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, my own Christian convictions and so forth. I'm kind of, I'm I'm stuck a little bit between wanting to do things that are wholesome and pure. They can be silly, but I, I don't want to um, encourage anyone in something that's that's unwholesome. I'm stuck between that and my desire to be um, honest to the material that we have. Right. And you can't talk about classical education in antiquity without talking about this topic, which is right here in this section of the book. Absolutely. I know. No, I so think that's it, my, my little apology, my no, defense. I, I, I don't, yes. I I think um, definitely the, the warts and all approach is the way to go, Yeah. right? And so um, I think that um, when we encounter this kind of stuff, we handle it as delicately as we can. We don't treat it like a joke. Right. You know, we don't, uh, I don't, we don't oversell or we don't undersell. We kind of, we try to treat the topic right. know, as it, as it's presented. I mean, here we have a particular lens. We're talking about Maru's uh, take on all of yes. this. Um, and I really like how circumspect that he is. And I, and I, and I, I in fact, I like the delicacy in, with which he approaches the topic right. himself. Um, and so I um, assume you've read other books on this topic. Yes. And I, there's I, a, there's a famous one. Is it, it's, um, it's Kenneth Dover's book. Oh, right. Uh, Greek homosexuality uh, came out in the late seventies. Oh yes. Okay. Um, that's considered in some ways kind of the, the classic text on this, this topic. Alone. Yes. Yeah. The kind of a landmark. All right, Dave, um, we got to get out of here. Right. Before we go, tell us a little bit about the Moss Method and LLPSI, would you? Well, I have a major announcement to make, All actually, right. and that is the Black Friday Cyber Monday sale is coming right up. But that's not how we refer to it on this show, though. It's the Black Friday Monsai, right? <laughs> I thought you didn't like that. I love that. All right, so, okay, the Black Friday, Bla uh, Black Friday, you can't Black even Monday. You love it, you can't even say it. Well, it's because that's what I like the abbreviation. The Black Friday Monsai. The Black Friday Monsai. The Black Friday Cyber Monday deal. What is the deal? It's going to begin on Wednesday. Wednesday, November, what would that be? Um, that would 22. Be 22. Yes. November 22 at, uh, I guess it'd be midnight or 12.01 a.m. Wednesday, November 22. And it will run until the following Wednesday, All which right. I guess would be November 29. Yes. All right. Uh, midnight of that Tuesday, the 28th. And this is the deal. I've never done this before. For that short window of time, mm -hmm. I'm going to offer 20% off. That's huge. I'm taking a page out of the Hackett book. Yes. 20% off for the Moss Method or for my Latin course. Fantastic. So go to mossmethod.com, check out some of the free material, uh, see why you would want to take this course, and please also go to latinperdm.com slash LLPSI if you want to check out the Latin offerings. Just about a week ago, uh, the free videos, instructional videos on both Greek and Latin that I offer on the YouTube channel surpassed 2,000 separate lessons. That's fantastic. So there's, um, I don't know, several years worth of viewing, honestly. Excellent. Yes. Um, all right. So if, if they want to learn how to, 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 to read Greek and read Latin, That's uh, correct. this is the way to go. So please check that out. Yes. All right. We have to thank some people. Who, who do we have to thank? Uh, what's the name of that one uh, talented young woman who helps us with the production? Oh, of that'd this? be Mishka. It's, Mickey, what no. is it? Mishka. Mishka. On. Yes, Mishka, our intrepid engineer, right? Uh, doing great work week after week. Um, quick turnaround time. Lightning fast. Yeah, makes us sound great. Um, and also... So, so thank you, Mishka. Thank you, Mishka. Don't forget that. Of course, right. Uh, and also the big thanks to Scott Vinzen and Ken Tamplin. Um, they're the guys behind the great music right. that you hear at the beginning and, and, uh, and uh, bumpering the ads. Uh, those two talented guys, uh, mm -hmm. phenomenal. Yeah. And so generous sharing their music with us. Ken Tamplin, VocalAcademy.com. He just got something like 185 million views. <laughs> Did uh, he really? Uh, yeah, on uh, his YouTube channel. Really check uh, his vocal, his reactions. Uh, they're funny. They're great. The guy so has a, a five octave range. He can really sing. So Unreal. So really impressive. Yep. And Scott, uh, Scott Van Zen Music School.com yes. is the place you want to see how to play guitar like that. Fantastic. 
So hey, if we if you wanna um, get a have a shout out, um, if you have an idea for a show, you got questions, don't hesitate to contact us. You can write to Dave, Dave at adnauseum.com. Don't forget that V. Or Jeff at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Wish him happy birthday. Yes. You could say something like happy birthday, old man. Yes. I don't please. say that. Right. I, I don't mind. You don't mind. I've accepted it. You yeah. can go to adnauseum.com in the lurch with merch section. Uh, pick yourself up a hat or a t-shirt. Yep. Jeff, what are we going to do next week? Um, should we uh, just uh, say TBA? I think TBA, TBA. T- and TBD. TBD. And exactly. plus any other letters we'd want to put after T and B. But we're going to take a break from Maru. That's right. And we're going to uh, get some other topics on the table. And, That's and right. And see where this takes us. Maybe something a little bit seasonal uh, or a little bit topical. That could be interesting. Remember last year for uh, Thanksgiving, we did uh, colonial Latin poetry. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that was very interesting. That, that was completely a, brand new to me. That was, that was that, fun. Remember all of the different uh, animals in Latin that uh, <laughs> spotted the American landscape? That's right. That's there right. There was the beaver and the otter and the lynx and so forth. Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. And Jeff, I think you have the gustatory parting shot. Now, this is a long one. It is. And it's not intended <laughs> to be funny. But. But I found it funny when I read it. Right. This is one. This is uh, the writings of one Christopher Ryan and Kakilda Jitha. Yes. And they write, think it's rational to be grossed out by eating bugs? Think again. (laughs) 100 grams of dehydrated cricket contains 1,550 milligrams of iron. 340 milligrams of calcium and 25 milligrams of zinc. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Well, yeah. <laughs> I have to eat 100 grams of cricket to get 25 milligrams of zinc? That's right. Okay. Exactly. How many crickets that amounts to? Uh, three mil- minerals often missing in the diets of the chronic poor. Insects are richer in minerals and healthy fats than beef or pork. Freaked out by the exoskeleton? Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> and tana? Yes, again. And the way too many legs? Yes, uh, three times yes. <laughs> then stick, stick to the turf and forget the surf. <laughs> because shrimps, <laughs> crabs, and lobsters are all anthropods, just like grasshoppers. Hold on now. Yeah. Is he actually saying that if I eat a, a shrimp or a lobster, it's just the same as eating like a ton of crickets? He's, he's saying, look, look, shrimp, crab, and lobster, they're all kind of hoity-toity foods, but it's the same thing as the grasshopper. Why aren't you popping crickets in your mouth? I Why see. don't they have the same cachet? Maybe if I had a big bowl of butter and one of those wooden hammers, <laughs> I could smash the cricket over the head and pull his tail off. <laughs> yeah, Except exactly. they do, isn't it? Yes, right, right, okay. right. All right, this goes on. And they eat the nastiest of what sinks to the bottom of the ocean, so don't talk about bugs' disgusting diets. Anyway, you may have bug parts stuck between your teeth right now. Definitely not. (laughs) The Food and Drug Administration tells its inspectors to ignore the insect parts in black pepper unless they find more than 475 of them per 50 grams on average. Hold on now. I just, uh, I have this nice uh, black pepper grinder at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You take the little lid off the top and you can just put it on your eggs or on anything delicious. Yes. And ever since I read this... Now every time... Are you checking for parts? I'm checking for bug parts in my black pepper. I think it tastes like a black peppercorn, but it could be a cricket head. You don't know. Who you knows? Don't know, maybe you're just getting this a little extra zinc, right? A fact sheet from Ohio State University estimates that Americans unknowingly eat an average between one and two pounds of insects per year. Now, is all this supposed to be persuasive? Well, I'm, it sounds... It's it If sounds, I unknowingly eat, okay, but I'm not right. going to knowingly eat... I don't like kind of the, the heavy handed kind of the polemic of it. Like, I don't either. You know, I, yeah, are you are you are you freaked out by the exoskeleton? <laughs> you wuss, right? So you're not really on the in- insectivore wagon. No, this is the, I find this less than persuasive. Okay, thanks right. for listening. Thank you. Thank you.